Dear friends, welcome to the opening of In Afghanistan. Welcome to 24 hours in Afghanistan. This has been a long journey. Many years ago, we decided that one of our future projects would be a photo exhibition about women in Afghanistan. And we looked everywhere, we traveled, we researched, but the problem was we never found the photos we thought would give us the right, or should I say the best, or the new story. However, during this period, we did find a very interesting photo series about American soldiers in Afghanistan. And the idea was born to bring together the soldiers with some powerful, still not found photos of Afghan women. And then suddenly, it was there. In a series in National Geographic, a stunning and colorful photos we had been looking for. The exhibition was complete, almost. Because our expert on Afghanistan was making this documentary project with three young women. They were telling the stories about their everyday life in Kabul. And we realized that this would give the exhibition a new dimension. And here we are at the grand opening 24 hours into Afghanistan. So much creative power, so much energy, such a fantastic and inspiring process. And deep sorrow. Because the photographer of the series Infidel and Sleeping Soldiers, Tim Hetherington, died while on a mission in Libya last spring. He was involved in our exhibition plans very early. And we are really honored and moved to present his photos here today. Assignment editor John Josh Lustig Opanos, Tim's agency, will present his work here today. We are also so pleased that you could come, Lindsay Dario, responsible for this unique series, Veiled Rebellion, and frequently visiting Afghanistan the last 11 years. And she comes with her six weeks old son. <laughs> it's good to have you here. And Amr Mohammed and Christopher Ness, responsible for the documentary project, The Kabul Cards, a refreshing new way of communicating. And not least, coming from Afghanistan yesterday, Sadaf, 19 years old and sender of the Kabul cards. She works together with Nargis, she is not present because she was denied admittance to Norway, and Sahar, who was too young to be invited. Sadaf. And you know, we can see from one of your cards that you were participating in a demonstration against street harassment. Could you say a few words about that? Yeah, um, demonstration about street harassment, it was something that we did to talk to our people. Street harassment is a big and serious problem for all women. And the women are half part, uh, part of the society. They should live without street harassment, men harassing, and they, are, they should live without any harass. They should live work that they like to do, and it's what our goal. To tell yeah, so and we agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know what she does? She's studying music. You're playing drums. Yes. So what are your plans for the future? Uh, I want to be a, an Afghan woman musician. I want to have a rock band, first rock band. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I know that you actually have a great support from your family. Exactly. That is quite unique, isn't it? <laughs> yes. I'm very happy and lucky to have my family. They are always support me. My father always telling me and to my sister, I'm very happy to have you. Daughter is uh, like a 
like a candle, like a light. And I'm happy that I have four candles in my hand. I'm oh. very happy. <laughs> forward to know more about you later and I think that your strong will and your strong will to change your country gives hope and in, it impresses all of us. And you will all have the opportunity to know more about the exhibition and the people behind it in a little while as our director of exhibitions Livas Svedrup and author and researcher Laila Bukhari will moderate talks with Josh and Lindsay and with Anders, Christopher and Sadaf from 7 o'clock. So as a tribute to all of you and the important work you do, we'll now have a musical performance, Fragile, by the Young Suffering Ensemble. If blood will flow When flesh and steel are one Drying in the color of the evening sun. Tomorrow's rain will wash the stains away. But something in our minds will always stay. <coughs> Perhaps this final act was meant to clinch a lifetime's argument that nothing comes from violence and nothing ever could for all those born beneath an angry star. Lest we forget how fragile we are. Tears from a star, like tears from a star. On and on the rain will say how fragile we are, how fragile we are. A very good friend of the Peace Center, a specialist in Afghanistan, one of the most distinguished BBC correspondents and anchors. She managed to get here two minutes ago, <laughs> Liz set. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Good evening. First of all, I must apologize deeply and I, I think if you've ever come in uh, touch with a journalist of any kind you always know that journalism is an excuse for bad manners and bad <laughs> behavior but I promise you it wasn't my fault of course that's the other problem with journalists they always blame it on somebody else but I am going to blame it on British Airways and on Norway's airport because the plane was late in arriving 
but it is so wonderful to be here. And I have to say, before I pay tribute to the work of wonderful photojournalists and to Afghanistan, I want to pay tribute to you, all of you, Oslo residents, from, if I look across this room, so many ages, so many different walks of life. It's Friday night in Oslo, and you're jam-packed into the Nobel Peace Center. Fantastic. I think it's a great tribute to you, to you as, a, as an urban society. And I want to say, for me, it is a special treat. I do feel a special bond with the Nobel Peace Center, and especially at this time of year, when we're inside this warm and wonderful surroundings of the Peace Center, when it's wintry outside, and of course it's this time of the year, the awarding a few months ago, not long ago, of the Nobel Peace Prize, and that's the most extraordinary time, and certainly I know from my own experience, the busiest time for the Nobel Peace Center. But of course, all of you who live in Oslo, or even if you don't, but still come to the, the Nobel Peace Center, you know that throughout the year, the center brings to you all these extraordinary worlds beyond your door, these ex exhibitions that challenge you, that make you think, and make you ask questions. And I'm just wondering whether tonight, as we gather here, do we have to ask a question? Why a center, which takes the name of peace, is bringing us an exhibition about war? And not just about war, about a country that has been at war for 30 years. As long as anyone, including Sadat, for all of your years, your country has been at some kind of war. And not just that, pictures of the American soldiers who fight this war. And pictures, photographs of the Afghan women who in so many ways suffer from this war and fight their own wars within them. But no, tonight we are gathered here because we are honoring some extraordinary journalists, some photojournalists, who ask us not just to look, but to see a world behind the war. Tonight we are going to see that world through the eyes of Lindsay Adario, I think you're Thomas, of Anders, Anders, am I pronounced Anders Somhammer? Did I pronounce it correctly? <laughs> My Norwegians are very good. Um, and Christopher, Christopher Nas, and of course, the Afghan women. But I want to speak, and of course, the late, great Tim Hetherington. How we wish with all of our hearts and warmth, we wish he was here with us tonight. Of course, he might have been in Syria if he was still alive today, but we, I think he's with us here in spirit. And I want to speak just a little bit about each of these photojournalists, because they're asking us to see the world through their eyes. And in order to do that, we should also understand a bit more about what's in their head and in what's in their heart. Because photojournalism is a special kind of storytelling. And I should say, it is the bravest kind of storytelling. I'm a storyteller too. I've been going to Afghanistan since 1988. I'm a television broadcaster and radio too. And like my, is my friend and colleague Ro here? Yeah. There's Ro. Well, you know, Ro and I, to tell our stories, you all know Ro from a recent television, if we want, we could tell our verbal stories about Afghanistan right from here. We don't even have to leave Oslo. Or we could and do go to Kabul itself from a safe location. Or we could and do go to the streets of Afghan cities. We could go to the homes and we could go to the front line. And we do. We have a choice. But the photojournalists don't. They have to be at the sharpest edge of the story they want to tell. They have to be there. There's no pretending. They have to be there if they're going to bring us there. Let me just tell you then a few stories. Let me just take you away from this Oslo night, from this wonderful country, and it is a country like my country, Canada, which should now know more about Afghanistan because our soldiers <coughs> have fought and have been killed there. Our aid workers have gone there, our journalists have. Your country, like mine, should know more about Libya. Our fighter jets have gone there. They have gone to take part in that brutal war last year, but also to be part of an extraordinary revolution that no one in this room can be ignorant of. They flew in the no-fly zone, they were part of the NATO mission, and part of what we have called the responsibility to protect. 
So the planes went in and out of Libya last year, and so did the journalists. And at that time, many articles were written saying, look at all these young, inexperienced, ambitious journalists who are going to the front line in Libya. What are they doing? Is this rational? Is it rash? They want to make their name. They want to take this photo. So many people asked, this was too dangerous. But the other photojournalists went to the greatest photojournalists of our times, the chronicles of all of the conflicts that we have seen year in, year out, decade by decade. On the 19th of April last year, one of those great photojournalists, Tim Hetherington, sent a message on Twitter, and it went something like this. I'm in the besieged Libyan city of Misrata. Indiscriminate shelling by Libyan forces. No sign of NATO. The next day, that indiscriminate shelling killed four-year-old Tim Hetherington. It killed another renowned photojournalist, Chris Hondras. And it also injured Guy Martin. And countless other Libyans whose names we'll never know. And maybe because these were the kind of journalists who take the pictures, as the saying goes, are worth a thousand words. But these were the greatest kinds of photojournalists whose pictures were worth thousands of words. And when this news went like an electrical current around the world that they were dead, people simply couldn't find the words to convey. The friends, the family, people who had worked with these, with these journalists, the many more who appreciated their work. And we cursed the randomness of war, the cruelty. How dare they take away these special journalists who had so much more life to give, so much more life to live. And on that day, I was at work, and I called a friend, James Brabazon. He had been with Tim Hetherington in Liberia. I also know James from working in Liberia. And James, how would I describe him that day? Shocked and shattered. How could this happen to Tim, he said. He was so cautious as a journalist. He was brave, but no bravado. How could he have lost his life? In 2002, they both went into Liberia together. It was Tim Hetherington's first war, but not his last. And it was the worst kind of war with the worst kind of crimes. And Tim saw it, he photographed it, he stayed with it, he told the story, and he suffered from it. And he was brave enough to say he had to have counseling after. But he went on to tell other stories. He wasn't a war reporter, as James would put it. He wanted to tell the story of the men who go to war, the men who shoot with their guns, and he shot with his camera. He literally tried to get under the skin of those who went to war, in effect, to show the humanity underneath. Look at the photographs that you're going to see at the center tonight. American soldiers like you have never seen them before. There's no helmets. There's no flak jackets. There's no body armor. There's none of that psychological armor that the soldiers must use to survive in the war. It was like his Oscar-nominated documentary Restrepo, an intimate diary of what it was to go to war. It was at moments terrifying, and at other moments it was tedious. He spent some nine months taking those pictures in the Korangal Valley of Afghanistan. And if you know anything about the Korangal, you will know. It is, without exaggeration, or it has been, one of the most dangerous countries, places, in the world. Why would anyone go to the Korangal Valley unless they really had to? Lindsay Adario also went to the Korangal Valley in Afghanistan. But if you go and go to her website, lindsayadario.com, and you will see the first image that comes up from the Korangal Valley, 
is not an American soldier, although there's lots of them inside. It is the picture of a young Afghan boy, and I promise you or warn you, that image will not leave you. Because it's the kind of boy, like any Norwegian boy, who'd have a little sticky plaster here and a little sticky plaster here, the kind of ones you get from falling in the park. But look at the eyes of this little boy. Brown, big, watery, bloodshot. These are the eyes of a boy who has seen a lot more. And Lindsay Adario fought to get that photograph published. And let me just read to you, she said, told me it's okay, what she said to her editor-in-chief in an email when she worried that that photograph would not be published. After all I have done to get these images of war, up close, personal, soldiers and civilians, please stick your neck out in the most minimal way. To hear you don't want to risk further scrutiny after I risked my life for two months is the most offensive thing I have ever heard. <laughs> now, you're going to meet this nice Lindsay Adario tonight and you're going to say, her? She said that? But this is a woman who is passionate about her work. She's fiercely determined to get those images and fiercely determined to make sure you see them. Otherwise, why go to the Korengal Valley if you can't see and also let the rest of us see what you have decided you should see? And it wasn't just Afghanistan. It was also Haiti, Darfur, Iraq. But Afghanistan for Lindsay is like Afghanistan for many of us. And I can say Kai Ida is here tonight as well and with Gro. And Afghanistan has this quality of drawing you in. I always say nobody goes to Afghanistan once. She spent 11 years going in and out of Afghanistan, including one year under the Taliban where she photographed women. But the story she is bringing us tonight at the Nobel Peace Center is not a story of war. It's a story called Rebellion, Veiled Rebellion. And it's a story about the, the people that we think are suffering most in this war, the most oppressed, the ones that, you know, on the front pages of papers, often look like victims. But these are women who are veiled, protesting in the streets, driving cars, shooting, boxing, the kind of images that I'm sure that you will have the reaction that I had when I looked. You'll go, silently or why did I not say it out loud? Wow, what's happening there? What? Way to go! These are the images of the women of Afghanistan, the story that Lindsay has brought to us. And these are the stories that, of course, have to also be brought by the women themselves. And for this, we are grateful to Anders and Christopher for helping these Afghan women to tell their stories in their own words. Stories about learning how to drive a car, which judging from the shrieking that's going on in the car is almost as dangerous as going to war. <laughs> stories about something which we, every one of us here takes for granted, which is holding up a protest banner in the streets of Kabul. And when I saw the look on your face, it was almost as if you thought, I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> and there you were, Mabruk, Tabrik Bashat. These are the stories that Afghan women are telling themselves. And we must thank Anders. Anders, I'm sure you know Anders and Christopher's work much better because they are, of course, your fellow Norwegians. Anders won a Freedom of Expression Award for his independent and critical reporting on Afghanistan. And I love the story about how you went to Afghanistan in 2006 with a group of other Norwegian journalists and with the Norwegian army. And you were told it was too dangerous and you had to stick with your group. But he decided that he would go on his own and he found an Afghan guide and went out into the streets of Kabul and found a very different world and is telling those stories to this day. We have this expression in journalism. We call it instinct. We call it the feeling in your gut. That feeling of being at the right place at the right time. And when it happens, it can be magical. That's what we say in my business, the magic of television. The extraordinary stories, the exquisite places, the eloquent people. 
For photojournalists, it's the moments, the milliseconds of a moment that they bring to us in the snapshot. But sadly, journalists are people too. And sometimes that inner compass fails us too. That we're not in the right place at the right time, but we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's what happened to Tim Hetherington. And when he was killed, many journalists, including Lindsay, said, is it really worth it? Should we be doing this kind of work? Isn't this too high a price to pay? And yet, when the grief passes, there is this something, this ephemeral, it's very difficult to put a, put a word on it, that irrepressible urge just to go out, to be there, to tell the story, to keep telling the story wherever it happens, to be there so the rest of us can be there as well. And so tonight, I think all of us together should thank these extraordinary photojournalists who go to the front line and continue to go, and go behind the front line to tell us those other stories. We thank you, we honor you, and we say, as they say in Afghanistan, Safa Kosh, may your journey be happy. This one and the ones to come. Tashakko. On the journey into Afghanistan, we would like to send you a little caring musical postcard um, from Norway. Uh, uh, we will sing this in Norwegian, but it's called to build a home. Yeah. Hey. 